cardinal rule at conferences. I've criticized previous speakers. But uh, can I thank the organization, particularly Mohammed and Natalie, for this very nice workshop, which has been very interesting. Who else? Emmanuel? Okay, Brian Hill, sorry. He looks too young to me. Okay, I'm, I'm testing a theory. I'm not estimating a theory, you'll be glad to hear. So I'm not estimating any functional forms, though I agree with Glenn that's what we should do. But this particular theory has no parameters, it has no functions, which makes it a particularly interesting theory. It's joint work with two of my doctoral students. Do we have a clicker? Nutterporn and, well, Nutterporn's a strange name. He, he likes to be called Nut. Which he, and you can't call him Porn. So, uh, OK. So this is all about satisficing, which is a term that Simon introduced many years ago before most of you were born. He coined this expression. He talked about decision makers being satisfied if they achieved a given aspiration level. So this is a crucial word in Mansky's theory, an aspiration level. He didn't say where it came from. And this is what I like about this theory. He doesn't, Simon never said when people should satisfy us and how they should satisfy us in terms of choosing the aspiration level. And that's what I like about this theory. Now, let me ask, this is always a bad question. How many of you are familiar with this theory? Could you please show? OK. Well, that's a pity. It's the person I've just criticized. <laughs> so you'll be out to jump on me. I think this is a very nice theory because, it, well, OK. This is a theory that's just been published in Mohammed's journal, Theory and Decision. And I think it's very clever. It's satisfying in the title. And what he does with this theory explains when people should satisfy us and how they should satisfy us in terms of choosing their aspiration levels. And it's a very simple theory. That's one of the things I like about it. There's not lots of complicated mathematics. Um, the preference function is dead simple. And the decision rules are very simple. And perhaps that sort of explains the experimental results I've got, because our subjects managed to do the the sort of intuitively simple bits of it, but the more complicated bits of the story they had trouble with. It brings into idea the, the idea that people have trouble working out the decision problem. When we test economic theory, we assume that our subjects know the theory, understand the theory, and can in implement the theory. I'm looking at people, but they're not agreeing with me. OK. OK. Now, his theory. I mean, there are lots of theories trying to explain satisficing. I put a short list up here. There's the ambiguity literature, which tries to explain satisficing in one way. The imprecise or incomplete preferences also does the same. And rational in inattention. Fabio, you didn't mention that. Your model seems to be in that class of limited attention models. No, absolutely not. Yeah. It's time not? It's exogenous. OK. The time, the time you are given by God is the remainder of okay. time. But at the end of the day, they have random choice models. OK, so in that sense, it's similar. OK. Now, what we do is we test this model. Now, um, let me just give you a quick overview of the decision problem as posed by Mansky. This is the, the paper. It can be found in Theory and Decision. I think it's brilliant, but uh, I'm prejudiced. OK, there's Mansky, for those of you who don't know him. OK, so the story is the following one. The decision maker has to choose an action from a known finite ordered choice set. I got very confused in the middle about, about what this means. OK, basically, there's a set of actions. Each action leads to a payoff. OK, and this payoff, the range of possible payoffs is known, but they're not the particular payoffs. So the decision maker knows that the lowest possible payoff is some number L, knows the highest possible number is some payoff is some number U, but knows nothing at all about anything in between. And this is quite crucial to experimentally investigating. How do you do that in the laboratory? OK. So I already said that. OK. And basically what the decision maker gets at the end of the day is the payoff associated with the chosen action. So the decision maker has to choose an action from a set of possible actions, each with an associated payoff. And what the decision maker gets paid at the end of the day is the payoff associated with the action chosen, less any costs of finding it. OK, there are costs of 
getting information at the cost of learning about this set of payoffs. And that's the basic story. Okay. Now, where, where I think Mansky goes one step further than other theories of satisfying is that he dis considers the decision makers having a two-stage process. First, he chooses a strategy. And the three strategies the individual can choose are these ones. Okay? So the decision maker can choose no deliberation. I'll tell you the consequences. Well, the consequences are the decision maker gets the lowest payoff. If he doesn't think, he doesn't search, if you like to use that word. Secondly, he can satisfy. In other words, he can search for payoffs greater than some specified aspiration level. So it's a sequential story. The decision maker knows the lower bound, let's say one, the upper bound 100, doesn't know anything about where the payoffs are in between, but he can ask the question, are there any payoffs greater than 50, say? And that's the kind of question the decision maker asks. Are there any payoffs greater than some aspiration level, say 50? And you'll see in a moment what they're told. The decision maker is told either, yes, there are payoffs greater than 50, or no, there are not. So if the decision maker chooses to satisfy, tries to find out if there are payoffs greater than some aspiration level, the information, some information is given to the decision maker, and therefore they can update their views about the lower and upper bounds. I'll explain that in a second. Okay? Or they can choose to optimize. And optimize is discovering at a cost, as you'll see in a moment, the highest payoff. And if they optimize, they get the highest payoff, less the costs of getting it. I'll talk about costs in a moment. OK, well, there are, okay, there are two costs. There's a big cost, big K. And this is what the decision maker has to pay for discovering what the best, the highest payoff is. There's a little, a lower cost, little k, which is the cost of satisfying. So the decision maker wants to discover if there are any payoffs greater than some aspiration level, which I'm going to call t shortly. He pays little k, and he's given the information. Either there is some payoff greater than that, or there is not some payoff greater than that. OK, so these are the three strategies the decision maker can choose. I mean, this, this satisfying looks a bit like a search model, the aspiration level being if you get above it. But it, the great point about Mansky's theory is that the decision maker can satisfy several times, not just once. I mean, just imagine what you would do faced with this choice problem. I, I know what I would do. I'm told there are payoffs between 1 and 100 euros, or 100, 1 and 100 pounds. But that's a lot less money these days, OK? So I'm told they're between 1 and 100. And what I would do is try and search where they are. I don't know where they are. No, there's no information about where they are. So what I would do is say, OK, let's look at the middle. Let's take 50. I'd ask the question, are there any payoffs greater than 50 or not? I'd pay a little k to get that information, and I would be either told, yes, there are, or no, there are not. OK? Suppose I'm told, yes, there are greater than 50. What is the intuitively obvious thing to do at the next stage? I would then cut the remaining space in two. I would then ask the question, are there any payoffs greater than 75? Pay a little k to get that information and be told either yes or no. I mean, this is my intuition, which actually is supported by his theorems. Um, so what I would do is sort of subdivide the remaining space. I start with a big space, 1 to 100. I would then chop it in two. Is there anything in this region? Is there anything in this region? If there's nothing in this region, I then subdivide the lower space and continue in that way. Does that seem reasonable? Some of you are looking worried <laughs> or tired. You're waiting to go to the restaurant. I know you are. OK. And if you choose to have no deliberation, if you decide the costs, little k and big k, are too high, you might decide, well, I can't say fuck it, can I? I'm not going to bother. I just will take the lowest payoff, and I won't get charged for it. OK? So those are the three decisions. Either optimize, pay a big K to find out the highest payoff, do nothing, pay nothing, get the lowest payoff, or do this satisficing procedure. And the crucial point, of course, to me, is this satisficing procedure. So is it clear what's being modeled here? Some of you are nodding. OK, that's good. OK? And of course, costs are subtracted from the payoffs to determine the net payoff to the subject. OK, well, I mean, these results are obvious, which is what I like about this theory. Um, 
So finding the best, what Mansky calls optimizing, is the best strategy. If this big K, the cost of finding the best, is sufficiently small, I mean, there's some maths to prove it, but this is intuitively sensible. So if the cost of finding out the best payoff is sufficiently small, you pay a big K, find out what the best is, and go home happy. Okay? Satisfying is optimal if big K is too big, but little k is small enough. Again, that's intuitively obvious. Okay? And finally, no deliberation is optimal if both big K and little k are too big. What, what too big and too small are depends upon his theory, and that's the, one of the difficult bits of his theory for a subject to, to understand. But the setting of the aspiration levels is not. Okay, here's a quote from Mansky. Let me, let me just let you read it. So it's a two-stage procedure. The first stage, the decision maker decides either to optimize, satisfy, or do no deliberation. If he or she decides to satisfy, then has to choose an aspiration level or a sequence of aspiration levels through which they update their information. Okay, so this is the two stages. Eddie, you're looking very quizzical. No? You're happy. OK, that's the story. Now, Mansky's got some assumptions. And this is obviously crucial to his solution. And the first thing, you'll see why. Well, I think you'll see a why a bit of it. He uses minimax regret criterion. So he, assume, can you see? he assumes that the decision maker wants to minimize the maximum regret from his procedure, from his strategy. Perhaps you can anticipate why he or she uses, well, why Mansky, sorry, why Mansky uses that. It's because. The decision maker is not told anything at all about the distribution of the payoffs. There are no probabilities. There are no probabilities there for the decision maker to get hold of. So you can't use expected utility or the more complicated versions because they rely on probabilities. So that's one reason why he uses minimax regret. So he assumes the decision maker wants to minimize the maximum regret. This is a very old fashioned decision theory, which I think Mansky has explored before. Some of you are not liking it, OK? So that's what this, this obviously drives the results. And if you don't like this assumption and the, the paraphernalia that goes with it, then you won't like the conclusions. But I think it's nice. OK, this perhaps gives the game away. So if instead of using minimax regret, which is a decision rule you can use when you don't know the probabilities, you have no idea about the payoffs, an alternative is maximin. That's an alternative decision rule that doesn't require probabilities. But he's obviously done the maths, and he says it's uninteresting, and he won't be able to sell it to a journal. I don't know whether that's a good scientific reason for choosing another criterion, but he chooses minimax regret. If he used maximin, he wouldn't be able to sell this paper. But he has sold it successfully. <laughs> OK. OK. So this is the rules of the game. Well, I think I've already told you this. If the decision maker decides to satisfy, he or she pays a cost, little k, and specifies an aspiration level. He's then told one of two things. Either there is a payoff greater than t, or there is not a payoff greater than t. So he's given some information. That's the whole point of setting these aspiration levels, to learn something about the payoffs you're facing. Okay? And obviously, this information enables the individual to update the lower and upper bounds. If the lower bound starts at 1, the upper bound starts at 100. He tries an aspiration level of 50, and he's told there's nothing above that. Then obviously, L remains at 1, and U comes down to 50. If he's told there is something greater than 50, L goes up to 50, and U stays at 100. I actually write these rules down just so here we are. That's the rules, OK? 
So you start with an aspiration level, and I'm calling aspiration level T sub M in the mth round of satisfying. This is the way you update. If you're told there's nothing greater than your aspiration level Tm, the lower bound stays unchanged, and the upper bound comes down to what you've just set as your aspiration level. Because you've been told there's nothing greater than that. So your new upper bound is the aspiration level you've just set. Okay? If you are told there are pairs greater than the aspiration level T, then the lower bound is updated to the aspiration level you've just set, for which you've been told there are things greater than that, and the upper bound stays unchanged. So this updating rules leads to obviously updating the aspiration levels and leads to the dynamics <coughs> of the problem. Okay. Should I show you this slide? I'm not sure well, I want to slow you. This is, he's got two key propositions. I'm going to just do proposition two in a moment. Proposition one is a static version of his story, where if an individual decides to satisfy, he or she only satisfies once. But there is a bit of interesting thing about it. This tells you the various rules. I told you there were conditions on the K is what people should do. But the interesting point is this thing here. <coughs> so if they're just going to try satisfying once, according to his theory, if the individual minimizes the maximum regret, they should set the aspiration level equal to halfway between the upper and lower bounds. Yeah? Now I can see your thinking. This is not this conclusion that you should set the aspiration level halfway between the upper and lower bounds is not produced only by his theory. <coughs> it's produced by other theories, which I'll talk about later. But notice it's intuitive. You're told the lower bound. You're told the upper bound. Even my grandmother would set the aspiration level halfway between them. OK, you're looking at me and saying, what happens if people are risk-averse EU people? Well, there's no chance. Well, I'll show you in a moment. We try and get rid of EU people. Even though I'm the greatest exponent of EU on this planet, we try and get rid of it. I'll talk about the experiment. So this is Mansky Proposition 1, where they just satisfy once. But what's nice is that it's extendable to several rounds of, of satisficing. So if the individual decides to satisfy us, they must decide how many rounds of satisficing to do. That's the first part of the of the how part. And the second thing is how to decide where to set the aspiration levels. Let's look at that first. This is the nice result. In each round of satisficing, the decision maker should set the aspiration level halfway between the current upper and lower bounds, which they've learned about during the previous rounds. The rest of it is a lot of maths. Okay? I mean, actually, this, this result here about the, mac the optimal number of rounds of satisfying is extremely difficult to get. I mean, this is interesting about this paper. Some, some of the rules are simple and some are complicated. I think this rule is simple and subjects should be able to get there quickly. This rule here about the optimal number of rounds of, uh, of satisfying is, is difficult. The integral part of log of something, it's, it's messy. Okay. So this is his proposition too, and basically this is what we're testing. So notice there are various conditional bits. No deliberation is optimal if little k and big k are too big. Um, satisfying is optimal if little k and big little k is sufficiently small and big k is sufficiently big. And optimization optimization is best if both of them are sufficiently small. Okay. So we basically see, so there's the when part, which is really when you should optimize as a thing from no deliberation or optimize. And if you decide to satisfy how, so there's two parts to his theory, the when part and the how part. Any comments? No. So you know that after the text was the Sorry? discovered the upper and lower bound after the text by, by the end of the game, after he made his choice? The, the upper bound will be revealed to him at some point, so he can calculate. No, the no. So how does he calculate the regret? I, I missed something. Well, because they know what the maximum upper bound is. Oh, so they compare the 
compare it to relative to the maximum? So they tell the payoffs are between L, which is 1 to begin with, and U, which is 100 to begin with. And quite crucially, this is an ex-ante thing, so this is all done beforehand. So ex-ante, they know that the greatest possible payoff is U, the upper bound, and they can work on the basis of that. <coughs> I suppose that I go through a couple of stages and then I get U L M and U M. Yeah. And then I make my choice. What will be the value of my regret? Well, it ah, but the, okay, I take your point. It's okay. This is a. It's a whole thing is ex ante. And the, the, the so the decision maker chooses his or her strategy. Ex ante, right at the beginning of the problem, and doesn't revise it. Okay, which is a problem with testing it, which I'll come to in a moment. Okay, so there's no revision of this strategy. The decision maker decides at the beginning what to do, and then resolutely implements the strategy they decided. I don't think I've answered your question, but I'm, I was trying to. I'm trying to understand what is the regret here. How do I know the actual I have the regret? ex post regret? Exposed regret is the maximum value that I could have obtained. Yeah, exactly. Minus what I did. Exactly. But the maximum value will be revealed to me. No, not necessarily. So how will I experience regret? Well, this, you're talking about exposed regret. The whole theory is ex ante regret. You know what? The highest possible payoff at the beginning is, is, is you, the 100, OK? And it's ex ante. I mean, I take your point completely. If the decision maker revised his or her strategies that went through the game, then they'd get information and it would be revealed. And then they would probably know at each stage what the maximum regret is. OK. okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's one problem with running an experimental test of this, because it's an ex ante theory. It's not, an exp it's, not, it's not a sequential. The decision maker is resolute. So choose the strategy, tells it to his lawyer, buggers off to the Caribbean. OK? And the, 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 the solicitor, the lawyer, implements the strategy specified by the decision maker before he left. OK? Which makes a problem for an experiment, as we'll talk about shortly. Well, should we, should we talk about it now or later? Because it's interesting. How would you run an experiment asking your subjects to specify an ex ante strategy? I mean, how many of you run experiments where you ask? I mean, the game theorists do it. The game theorists ask their subjects to specify a strategy. And then the experiment implements the strategy of all the players in the game. But just imagine what a strategy is here. The decision maker has to specify for each problem whether they want to optimize, satisfy, or no deliberation. And given that, they must then specify the aspiration level in each round of, of satisficing. So the strategy is extremely complicated to describe. So, I mean, you could well say, well, I'm not testing Mansky's theory. I'm not testing it in the full ex ante self sense. I suppose I'm assuming that our subjects do this ex ante deliberation and then implement it without thinking about it. But I take your point. OK, I realize it's getting on to dinner time. OK, so there are three main bits of the theory. When to do no deliberation, satisficing, or optimizing, that's the when bit. How many rounds of satisficing to do, and how to choose the aspiration level. So there's a when bit and two how bits of this theory. OK, now, incentives. This is, perhaps comes back to your point. What do we pay these subjects? We need to give an incentive structure in keeping with the theory. The theory says that they're trying to minimize the maximum regret. What we actually did is pay them their payoff from, well, actually, we paid the average, but the average is irrelevant. We, t we paid them the payoff from, well, the average, well, forget the average, the average is unimportant, the payoff from each problem. Now, what's the relationship between the payoff and the maximum regret? So what we're assuming, the theory says they're minimizing the maximum regret. We are paying them their payoff. Okay? So basically, we're saying their payoff is inversely related to the maximum regret. 
ex ante, their maximum regret, of course, is determined by the maximum possible payoff, which is exogenous and given, and their actual payoff. Okay? So it is indeed true that their regret is the inverse, the, what's the word, inverse of the payoff. So we paid them their payoff. Anybody unhappy with that story? Because it's quite crucial. We paid them the payoff. Well, we paid them the average payoff. Of real, well, we paid them the average payoff because they could make losses on individual problems. And we didn't want to send our subjects away with losses. So we, we averaged. But there's well-known evidence, pity Glenn's not here, that subjects don't hedge in experiments. So I'm not un unhappy about paying them the average. The crucial point is that we pay them their payoff, and their payoff is inversely related to their regret. So maximizing the payoff is equivalent to minimizing the maximum regret they could endure. Some of you are sort of vaguely happy with that. OK. Uh, well, I don't know whether you want this detail. Let's, let's, we just had two treatments. It's sort of fashionable to have treatments. So we had two treatments, OK? Now, it was, it's important what subjects were told. We gave them 100 problems. We, we're a believer in the school of giving lots of problems to subjects. So we gave them 100 problems, which they went through sequentially. In each of them, they were told the lower and upper bounds. And we told them the payoffs we distributed, well, we didn't actually use this word ambiguously. I'll show you what we did tell the subjects. But we basically told them there is no distribution of payoffs. But, OK, they were told the little k and big k. Um, well, let's forget that. Let's forget that. So we, we divide up the parameter space into this is little k along this axis here. This is big k here. We chose problems in this parameter space. And this is the division of this parameter space. So the satisfies to give little k is sufficiently small, and big k is uh, sufficiently small, and little k is sufficiently small. That's the distribution. Well, I think I'll forget this, OK? Now, we needed to, dist to generate payoffs. In the theory, these payoffs are ambiguous. There's no distribution attached to them. Now, I know there are different ways of reproducing ambiguity in the laboratory. I use the famous bingo blower. Other people use Ellsberg urns. Other people employ small boys to choose numbers, OK? <laughs> what we did, I don't know whether you're familiar with this paper. There's a paper by Stecker et al. How to generate, oh, you, Peter knows this. OK, I think it's a brilliant paper. Or oh, you wrote it. No, I was the editor <laughs> accepting it. OK. I was most happy with that than any other. OK, it's, it's a clever paper, isn't it? So this is, I mean, it's sort of obviously generated, but it's generated on the Cauchy distributions, which have no moments, as I understand it, OK? It's a clever procedure. So this procedure enables you to generate payoffs, which certainly look ambiguous. Obviously, the, the, it's a random number generation. So there's, there's some gener process behind it. I'll show you in a moment. OK, we told the subject. Well, actually, let me show you these. What we did was this. In the instructions were two pages. This is the first page. In here, each of these 49 pictures is 10,000 simulations of random numbers drawn from a uniform distribution. OK? So in this, there's 10,000 numbers drawn from a uniform distribution in each of these. And they look sort of like uniform distributions. Yeah? Well, they are uniform distributions. We generate them that way. So each of those is 10,000 observations. So we show the subjects that's not what we're doing. That would be risky. What we're doing is generating them ambiguously. And if you employ this, this brilliant procedure that uh, Peter endorsed, this is the distribution, similarly, of 49 sets of 10,000 drawings from Stecker et al.'s ambiguous distribution. Now, as you can see, there's no, there's no pattern there. There's absolutely zero pattern here. There's a clear, very clear pattern to the numbers. Here, if you could see a pattern, you're cleverer than me. So I, this, is, this is what you're actually using? Yeah. But what, what, what do you tell them about? We showed them these. Uh -huh. We showed these two pages were in the instructions. We showed them these. And we, we told them, well, I forget the precise words we used, but we showed them both of these. This is crucial. You can look at this, and there's obviously <laughs> no distribution there, which is the whole point of this technique, isn't it? Which is clever. OK, let's press on a bit. 
I don't know whether we want to go through the basics. We're running out of time and dinner calls. Let's forget the instructions. So this is the, the sort of interface about as, specifying aspiration levels. This is if they specify an aspiration level. Well, there's nothing above it. They get a message. No one's got payoffs great enough. If they specify an aspiration level for which there are payoffs great enough, they're told, yes, there is at least one. So as they're stating their aspiration levels, they're charged at OK, but they get this information. OK, well, for those of you who like experimental detail, the software is written in Python, which I find the most incomprehensible <laughs> software package I've ever known. Who, do, does any of you use Python? Yes. It's, it's written by geeks for geeks. You must be geeks, are you? <laughs> it's terrible. Anyhow, it's written in Python, which is incomprehensible to human beings. But I think it's one of these softwares you have to get into. Once you get, but the indentation, if you get the indentation wrong, it doesn't run. I mean, MATLAB corrects the indentation for you. So we started writing ourselves and then gave up, and we asked uh, Paolo Cresetta to help us. That's what we paid out, roughly 13 pounds on average for an experiment which lasts about an hour, which, which in the UK is not a bad wage for students. The minimum wage, I think, is, what is the minimum wage? 7.20. Chris doesn't know the minimum wage. We just go up to the living wage. Okay, but this is above the, the, the minimum wage and the living wage. But one thing I'm not sure we should have done this. I mean, after Fabio's discussion, we didn't try and interfere with the time they took to decide. And I'm beginning more and more to think one should in experiments. I mean, if you don't speed them up or slow them down, the clever subjects will say, I know what we do, I just click at random. And I'm going to escape with almost as much as somebody who thinks about it. So I begin to think we should have a minimum time for each problem and a maximum time for each problem. So that that's not an additional variable, which Fabio showed very clearly, affects behavior. But we didn't in this experiment, which perhaps is a problem with it, okay? Anyhow, some de okay, now results. Well, I'm gonna show you a, an individual subject and then some horrendous scatters with lots of them, and then simply give you some results and then stop. Basically, the message is bits of Mansky's theorem theory work, the difficult, sorry, the easy bits, and bits of Mansky's theory don't work, the difficult bits, which I think is a message to us all about the difficulty of problems given to experiments. So this is a particular subject. Now, it's, it's obvious what's going on here. What we've plotted here for an individual subject is the subject's regret measured as the maximum payoff let, less their actual payoff against the theoretical regret. And you'll, you'll see, well, actually, their regret was much higher than the theory. I mean, this is the theoretical, what they should be doing. This is a 45 degree line. This is what they should be doing. But they're obviously regretting things much more than they should be doing, which is not surprising. OK, I'm going to finish, OK? This is on, in terms of payoffs. And this is an interesting story. So this is their actual payoff, and this is a theoretical payoff if they followed Mansky's theory. And there's sort of a roughly 45 degree line. Roughly, there's a relationship between them. I mean, these scatters are very wide scatters, OK? Um, let's forget that, let's forget that, let's forget that. Now, let's talk about <coughs> the when part, OK? So along here is what Mansky's theory should say, when you should know deliberation, satisfying and optimizing, and this is what the subjects actually did. So where the subject should be is down the main diagonal. So when theory says no deliberation, they should be doing no deliberation. So they should be down the main diagonal, and they're not. In fact, sometimes they're quite grossly not. They, they optimize, sorry, when they should be optimizing, they're doing no deliberation too often. So the when part of his theory doesn't work too well. Okay? Let's look at the first part of his how part. And this is how many rounds of satisficing. So down here is the number of rounds of satisficing that his theory said subjects should do. And this is the actual number of rounds of satisficing that subjects do do. And what you should expect is the numbers be down this main diagonal. And again, they're not but slightly better than in the previous graph. So this part of the how bit, they're doing a little bit better, okay? And finally, well, 
Now we do something which reveals that they do the second part of the how part not too badly. So what we're doing here is regressing the um, the theoretical sorry the actual their actual aspiration level, which we observe obviously, against the theoretical aspiration level. And of course the slope should be one. And if you cheat, the slope is almost one. But if you don't cheat and you throw in a constant term, you see the slope here is almost one, but the constant term is too high. So the, the actual regression of actual um, aspiration against optimal is just a bit higher than it should be. But it's not far away. It's not far away. So this bit, um, I'm not going to, it doesn't actually tell us. It doesn't tell us what R squared is. I wasn't going to reveal the R squared. But it's interesting that the, this coefficient, which should be 1, is almost 1, and this one that should be 0, is a bit away from 0. So it doesn't do too badly on the second part of the habit. I'm going to forget that. OK, let's forget all this. And then, so these are the three bits. Subjects are not following the when part, which I think is difficult for them to do. They're partly following the first of the how parts, and it's not so difficult. And they're generally, you know, on average, following the, th the second of the how parts, which is a relatively easy part to do, which is quite nice. It means that subjects are sort of doing what our intuition suggests that they should be doing. Now, this is a problem we've already discussed. The theory is an ex-ante theory. I find it difficult to think how we could implement it properly, asking subjects to state their full strategy, conditional on the parameters, of course, OK, that clock up there says six. Five minutes. Oh, I see, OK. OK. So we, what we actually did do is observe our subjects working through the problem rather than asking them. So you think it's not a fair test of the theory, but I'm not quite sure. This is what we should be doing, asking them to state their strategy, but I don't see how we can do it. How do they state the strategy? OK. Now, the obvious thing is that they don't have a minimax regret objective function, and they don't believe us about the distribution being ambiguous. I must admit, if I was a subject in this experiment, I would be an EU person, and I would assume a, a uniform risky distribution. And there's nothing to stop subjects doing that, OK? And actually, we, we've, we're beginning to fit this, and actually we find that's quite good, OK? And of course, the whole thing ignores subjects' thinking about what they should be doing. And it goes back to this earlier point about easy and difficult bits of the experiment. But economists have long thought about cost of thinking. I think they've given up on that. So thanks for listening. Thanks for your comments. <laughs> now it's time to go to the pub. Some questions for us. Oh, bugger. OK. If there are any. Uh, yeah. So at the end of the day, uh, what do you consider? Well, if you take the Mensky papers and your data, uh -huh. what do you think? Well, I would say bits of his theory work, but not all of it. I think the easy bits work, and the difficult bits don't work. Yeah, this is what you say. Yeah. Globally, what is your judgment now? Are you, well, do I you still consider that as a wonderful paper? Yeah, yeah. I think, uh, well, it depends. Am I speaking as a theorist or as an econometrician, as an experimentalist? As a theory, it's beautiful. As a theory, I mean, it depends how you judge a theory. I know we have different views about that. I judge a theory as be useful if it's empirically accurate. So as a theory, it's beautiful. And you're quite right to have published it, OK? So don't worry about that. <laughs> but it doesn't fit too well. But then 99% of economic theories don't fit too well. Yeah? And 110% of economic axioms are wrong without even bothering to take them into the lab. You know they're wrong. So it depends how you judge theory. Sorry, that was a bit of a strong answer. John, uh, you, you said you have two treatments. Uh -huh. I'm sorry, I missed one. OK, well, I didn't bother to go into detail. In the first treatment, we had four basic problems and repeated them, each of them 25 times in sequence to see if they were learning. And the other, we had 100 problems that were all different. So the treatment in which we had Four basic problems repeated 25 times in a sequence. We wanted to see if there was any learning. And I think they were learning 
not how to solve the problem, which is what we hoped they would learn, but they were learning about the distribution, even though there was nothing to learn because the distributions were ambiguous. And behavior was slightly different in those two treatments. Did you observe uh, an evolution in the behavior pattern of your subject, meaning if they learn how to behave better while practicing? We haven't checked that yet, but we should do. That's a good point, whether they're getting closer to it. I mean, that's why we have these two treatments, to see if they would learn in this treatment with repeatable problems. We should look at that. That's the signal, isn't it? brings in at the conference. Okay. So well, thank let's thank... Uh... <laughs> and thank you to all the speakers uh, oh. and uh, everyone in the conference. And on behalf of the organizers, we'd also like to thank the main organizer in the conference. Yeah.